right, are we on, Brother Shane? Okay. I didn't want to make the same mistake I made this morning. So, so how's everyone this evening? I'm good. We're going to start with two very familiar passages of Scripture and uh, then look at a couple of other uh, passages as well. Let's, uh, I'm going to have you go ahead and turn to Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Great Commission. And then we're going to go from there over to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. So. So start in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and then Acts 1, 8. Basically two times that Jesus gave uh, the same kind of instruction, a little bit different wording, uh, concerning the job that he was leaving his followers here to do. And uh, let's stand in reverence to God's word as we read these few verses, and then uh, we'll let you be seated. Acts 28, beginning in verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Now flip over to Acts 1 and verse 8. And again, this is uh, right before his ascension. And... Uh, the upper room meeting. And he said, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, or witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Our Heavenly Father, thank you again so much for your word, for, Lord, for your living word. Lord, no matter what age we live in, it still is alive and applies to our lives. Lord, your truth is truth for eternity. And Lord, may we use, Lord, the word you've given to us to accomplish the work that you've left us to do in the limited time that you have us here. Lord, help us to understand what you have to say to us. And Lord, may you be honored and glorified by all that's done this evening. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. There's a little thing I used to share with uh, some folks, something I, I read a few years ago that really uh, made an impact on me. I want to share it with you just to kind of set the tone for this evening. This is a poem that was written by a fellow by the name of Charles C. Finn. In 1966, I know nothing else about the man other than this. He says, don't be fooled by me. Don't be fooled by the face I wear, for I wear a mask. I wear a thousand masks. Masks that I'm afraid to take off, and none of them are me. Pretending is an art that's second nature with me, but don't be fooled. For God's sake, don't be fooled. I give you the impression I'm secure. Within as well as without, that confidence is my name and coolness is my game, that the water's calm and I'm in command, that I need no one. But don't believe me. Please don't believe me. My surface may seem smooth, but my surface is my mask, my ever-varying, ever-concealing mask. Beneath swells the real me in confusion, in fear, in aloneness. But I hide this. I don't want anyone to know it. I panic at the thought of my weakness and fear being exposed, and that's why I frantically create a mask to hide behind, a nonchalant, sophisticated facade to help me pretend, to shield me from the glance that knows. For such a glance is precisely my salvation, my only salvation, and I know it. That is, if it's followed by acceptance, if it's followed by love. It's the only thing that can liberate me from myself and from the barriers that I so painstakingly erect. It's the only thing that will assure me of what I can't assure myself, that I'm really worth something. But I don't tell you this. I don't dare. I'm afraid to. I'm afraid your glance will not be followed by acceptance and love. I'm afraid you'll think less of me, that you'll laugh, and your laugh would kill me. 
I'm afraid that deep down I'm nothing, that I'm no good, and that you'll see this and reject me. So I play my game, my desperate pretending game, with a facade of assurance without and a trembling child within, and so begins that parade of masks, and my life becomes a front. I idly chatter to you in the suave tones of surface talk, and I tell you everything that's really nothing, and nothing of what's everything, of what's crying out within me. So when I'm going through my routine, do not be fooled by what I'm saying. Please listen carefully and try to hear what I'm not saying. What I'd like to be able to say, and what for survival I need to say, but what I can't say. I dislike hiding. Honestly, I dislike the superficial game I'm playing, the superficial phony game. I'd really like to be genuine and spontaneous and me, but you've got to help me. You've got to hold out your hand, even when that's the last thing I seem to want or need. Only you can wipe away from my eyes the blank stare of the breathing dead, and only you can call me into aliveness. Each time you're kind and gentle and encouraging, each time you try to understand because you really care, my heart begins to grow wings. Very small wings and very feeble wings, but wings nonetheless. With your sensitivity and sympathy and your power of understanding, you breathe life into me, and I want you to know that. I want you to know how important you are to me and how you can be a creator of the person that is me if you choose to. So please choose to. You alone can break down the wall behind which I tremble and you alone can remove my mask. You alone can release me from my shadow world of panic and uncertainty from my lonely prison. So do not pass me by. Please do not pass me by. And it will not be easy for you. A long conviction of worthlessness builds strong walls. The nearer you approach to me, the blinder I may strike back. It's irrational. But despite what the books may say about men, I am irrational. I fight against the very thing that I cry out for. But I'm told that love is stronger than strong walls. And in this lies my hope, my only hope. Please try to beat down those walls with firm hands, but gentle hands. For a child is very sensitive. So who am I, you wonder? I'm someone you know very well. For I'm every man and every woman you will ever meet. Pretty powerful. Um, and that's speaking from a human standpoint. And the things that we as individuals can do to lift up one another. Just think when you, when you couple that with the gospel. And what a, a presentation we have to make because of the life change that God has brought into our lives, how we can reach out to the hurting people out there. I would ask uh, if, how many can relate to that. And I bet on some level everybody in here can. I can. Um, we are uh, surrounded by messages and songs um, and teachings that teach us to, to bury any kind of negativity or bury any kind of pain or hurt. Um, and yet that's not what we need. We need to come forward with it. Um, it's important that we reach out to folks around us. Before we attack uh, our text this morning, or this evening, I want you to look at Romans chapter 1. It talks a little bit more about this condition that we're talking about, that this... Uh, Charles Finn described here, but a little deeper and more on the spiritual side. Look at Romans chapter 1, and we're going to look at uh, several verses here, starting with verse uh, 16. This is Paul talking to the church at Rome. And he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes or qualities are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse but because they knew him, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. 
professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. And therefore God gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And for this reason God gave them over to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use of what is against nature. Likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman and burning in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to remain or to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind, to those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness, for they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, dis, uh, dis, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgments of God, that those who practice such things are de deserving of death. Not only do the same, but they approve of those who practice them. Is that not an accurate uh, description of what we see around us in the world today? I mean, you go right back from exchanging the glory of God into an image of the creature. You know, we, we've done that. Uh, the world is bought into evolution. And we have been uh, now... Um, demoted to about $7.62 worth of mineral deposits and, uh, and evolving from monkeys and headed nowhere but annihilation when we die. And that's, that's, that's a pretty sad existence. No wonder people uh, just lose hope. And then you have everything else that people look toward and turning to all the different sexual immoralities and things that we now accept and will make legal and everything else and uh, things that just go in completely against nature uh, knowing, knowing um, in their minds deep down the way that things ought to be and that they have uh, no excuse um, for living that way and for denying Christ and for die denying God walking away from Him. And God gave them over to all these different things and just let them just run them. You want to chase that? Okay, I'm going to let you do that and I'm going to let you see where the end result is. I think he does that with individuals. He lets us hit rock bottom, and he lets us hit it hard, so that when we do, we have only way, one way to look, and that's up. Uh, I have a good friend who I uh, was telling uh, some of the ladies earlier that uh, he's been an alcoholic since he was 13 years old, and he finally hit rock bottom. He's a couple of years older than I am. And uh, he finally reached out and said, Look, I, I need some help. Would you help me get some help? He's in a long-term rehab now in, uh, um, up in Riverdale, and he's doing great. Uh, Clear-headed, got a focus. He wants to turn around and help guys uh, that were just like him. And I think that's what God wants to do with us. He wants, once he lifts us out, he wants us to turn around and then help lift somebody else out. And we want, we want to tell them about how he, what he's done for me, how he picked me up, how he did what he did for me. And, uh, you know, we... A lot of people ask, well, what about the, the poor innocent Africans who've never heard the gospel? R.C. Sproul says, well, nothing. And he says, what? He says, there's no such thing as an innocent person. Because according to this passage, God has given evidence of himself and testimony of himself and everything that he's created. And you have to close your eyes and go through life blind and deaf and with no other physical contact to finally realize that. And even Helen Keller... <laughs> was led to, to understand that there is a God. Um, God will get to us. He loves us. He will get through to us. And uh, we have to then reach out to others around us. It is our job to tell folks that there is forgiveness and peace and that Jesus is the only way out of their sin. Yes, there is sin. And, and I'm not going to condemn you. You're already condemned. You go back over to... Uh, uh, to John 3, verses 14 through 21, and you have a long discourse there where, uh, where the whole discussion is that, you know, Christ came into the world not to condemn the world, because the world was condemned already without him. So this world is not condemned because it rejects Jesus. It was condemned before he ever got here. It's our job now to tell them there's a way out. 
And, uh, and, and that is what the whole, this whole Great Commission and why he left us here. You know, it, it would be a lot nicer, I think, and a lot more. Uh, uh, it had been mighty generous of, of God to, to say, uh, you know, I think I'm going to just, once you're saved, I'm just going to take you off the planet, and that way you, you can go clean, and you don't have to worry about uh, messing up. You don't have to worry about uh, tarnishing in my image. You don't have to worry about, uh, you just go. Just, just right. He's got a job for us to do, though. And that's why he left us here. When we look at the Great Commission in uh, Matthew 28, a lot of folks put the emphasis on the first word in verse 19. Go. That word, if you look at the original language, is not a verb. How many of you are already... Let me put it this way. How many of you... Just stay at home and you never go anywhere. Anybody? I didn't think I'd see any hands because if you did that, you wouldn't even be here. <laughs> you get out. Uh, you do your grocery shopping. You run errands. Um, some, of, some folks you know, will go to the post office so they got a neighbor they're caring about or a family member or somebody else. We, we, you got to go pay bills or whatever. It's, uh, it, all kind of things that carry us out. Uh, and about. That's what this is talking about. This particular word is better translated as you are going, because you're already going. Uh, it's as you're going about your daily life, as you're going about where I'm sending you to interact with people. There, I don't believe there's anybody who crosses our path that crosses our path by accident. I believe every, every interaction we have with other people is a divine interaction that the Lord has brought us together for a particular purpose. He has brought us here together tonight to study His Word, to lift Him up, to encourage one another. And, uh, and I pray that that's what we do every time we come together. And with this particular passage, you know, a lot of folks will, will say, okay, we'll go. The first thing we've got to do is we've got to schedule a visitation night. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a visitation night. I'm just saying don't let your Great Commission be limited to one night of visitation. It is an everyday 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week thing that everywhere you go, you are to be proclaiming Jesus Christ. Even a person who would be considered uh, someone on the shut-in list who can't get out, guess what? They still have people that drop by sometimes make deliveries. They still have people who will come by maybe uh, uh, to service something in the house. Repair people will come in. And, uh, you know, cable folks or whatever else, they still have people come to them. Lord says, okay, you can't get out. Guess what? I'm going to bring you somebody to interact with. And uh, we are to, to take all those things, those interactions, seriously. Um, there are a, a lot of ways that, that, we can, that we can do that, that we can interact with folks. And I want to give you some, just some basics uh, in doing that. Now, what is the focus of the Great Commission? If it's not go, go therefore and do what? It's what we talked about this morning. Make disciples. We are to make disciples. Why make disciples? Because the whole idea of making a disciple is that it's reproducible. You make disciples, so they go make disciples, so they go make disciples, so they go make disciples. And that's the way that God had intended for us to multiply and for us to get the word out. Um, the, the early believers weren't doing that, and uh, as a result, we wound up with a lot of persecution coming down on them, and it scattered them all over the world, and they went. <laughs> it wasn't under conditions they wanted to go, but they went, and when they did, they carried the gospel with them. And that's how we get the gospel scattered around the world, in addition to people like Paul and uh, Silas and Barnabas and Timothy and all the others that went out on the missionary journeys. Uh, so, uh, but we're to impact uh, where we are first also. But notice the other things. We're to make disciples. What does that include? Well, initially, baptizing them, first act of obedience of a believer as a testimony to those around. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And what? Teaching them to do what? All the things I've commanded you. How do we know what that is? We better be in the Word. We better be in the Word and know what He's commanded us and what He's taught us. And the key there is, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's not a threat going, okay, i got my eye on you. You, you better be doing it. No, it's to say, hey, I'm going to be with you I'm going to give you the power. I'm going to give you the motivation. I'm going to give you the insights through the presence of my Holy Spirit and through my word being within you. 
and through other believers around you. I will be working through all of that to help you accomplish the work that I've left you to do. If you look uh, in uh, back at the Acts passage, notice what he does. He starts in, uh, in one location and kind of moves out in uh, little concentric circles, uh, just starting small and going big like a target. He says, you should receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you. And you will what? Be my witnesses in Jerusalem, hometown, in Judea, a region, in Samaria, and the ends of the earth. You can break that down into your town, your county, your state, nation, go into the world. And we start at home. Uh, we make the mistake a lot of times. Uh, I'm very much behind about uh, mission work. My, my life was turned around as a teenager um, by Lord dealing with me on a mission trip where he got me away from my friends. I was a typical preacher's kid. I was telling Brother Doug earlier today, I was a typical preacher's kid. I was going to get into everything I could possibly get into, and I got so tired of people asking me, are you going to be a preacher like your dad when you grow up? And I wanted to live in such a way, they didn't have to ask me that question. They didn't say, there ain't no way he's going to be a preacher. And I was pretty successful with that. I wanted to be popular with, the, with everybody, and I found out later I wasn't popular at all. They all thought I was an idiot. Some of them knew what I had. Some of them knew. They could see their, I wasn't, didn't have the family life a lot of them had to deal with. I didn't have a lot of the other situations that they had to deal with. They saw, you know, you, okay, we're going to make fun of you. We're going to pick on you, but you're a fool. And it wasn't until the uh, Lord turned me around on the mission trip with my dad um, in a very dramatic way. It wasn't until then that I, I came back, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm surrendering to you. you know, I'm tired of fighting this. And I think about the passage where the uh, where Lord is talking to Saul when he meets him on the road to Damascus. Says, you're, you're kicking against the pricks or the goads is another word used for it. That's uh, the little staff that they used to drive the oxen and it had a, a sharp point on the end of it, a little curved point, and they would hit that on their, uh, around their uh, uh, the flanks or the feet or wherever they need to get them going up the road, get them to direction. And, these, and you kick back against that thing. You sink that up into, into your hide. And he says, uh, it's hard for you kicking against the ghost. I'm trying to direct you, and here you are fighting me, and it's hurting you more than it's hurting me. And that's, that was my life. Uh, as a result... Uh, and the Lord turned me around. I, I found out real quick that while I wasn't popular afterward, I got the respect of some folks, and I got their ear, and I could tell them about what the Lord had done in my life and help make a difference in theirs. And uh, that's what we're all about. Uh, we make the mistake a lot of times of going on mission trips, and we get all worked up over it, and then we come right back home, and we don't even know the neighbor's name across the street. Um, I'm still trying to get to know my neighbors the way that I would like to know them. And uh, we live in a rough part of town. We live over in East Griffin. Uh, one of the rougher neighborhoods over there, when we were uh, working doing ministry with uh, East Griffin Baptist Church over there, we, we really felt we needed to move into the neighborhood we were trying to reach. Um, it was not a neighborhood I would have picked moving into. Uh, I would, I'd rather be in a nice subdivision somewhere. You know, but I feel like the only way I can really impact lives there is living among the people and, and sharing with them on a daily basis. And, uh, and that's our desire. And the Lord has, has given us that opportunity to, to reach out to folks in a very poor area, an area that's loaded with, uh, with drugs, all kind of things. Um, and so pray for us as we continue to reach out to them and, uh, and work um, in spreading his kingdom in, uh, in our little neighborhood. There are some ways, I told you, that I would give you a little bit of practical ways of sharing with folks tonight. And uh, I mentioned one uh, as we are going, remember? And I mentioned one this morning that we like to do when we go out and, uh, and we're going somewhere to eat. Uh, you're already going to be praying. I hope you're going to be praying, thanking the Lord for what you got to eat in front of you. But if you're already going to be praying, why not invite them to share a request with you? And I don't ask 
is there something I can pray with you about? Because that gives them just a quick no and nope. That's a quick yes, no answer, no. Ask them, what can I pray with you about? When we give thanks for our meal, what can we pray with, for you about? Uh, and make them think. Now, they can still give a quick answer and go, oh, oh, nothing, I'm, I'm okay. But they've got to think about it, and they, they can't just throw out a quick yes or no. You planted a seed there and say, well, you know, the Lord knows all about what you're facing. You know, everybody's facing something, and uh, I'm just going gonna, gonna to lift up your name. And, uh, and pray for you. He knows what it is. And uh, I love, I'll take, I got receipts that I, I take and I will log places. When I go somewhere and I will, a lot of them will list the name of the, the cashier or the, the person on there, the server. Uh, and I will, will keep those and, and lift them up and I'll make notes right there on the receipt on the, what it was that, that maybe they shared with me as far as prayer requests. Uh, transfer that to a little prayer book I've got. Um, and then I will, I'll make little notes on, you know, if they well, I find out in our discussion about, about their family situation, about a job situation, about an illness, about some, we have all kind of things that, that people ask prayer for. Uh, we asked a lady in a, a town, we'd, in a place we'd not eaten before um, just the other day, and uh, she had just gotten the call that her uncle had passed. And she's dealing with that right there. We're, we're the first customers out of the box to, to talk to her after that. And she's, you can tell, she's, she's fighting it. I say, what? I tell you what, the Lord loves you, and, and I'm going to be praying for you and your family as you go through that. We got into a little discussion there about, uh, about her uncle. And all of those little interactions. Now, I understand. Uh, I'm going to give you some little quick things like that that you can share in talking to somebody. Because I know when you're out and about and you're going to somebody's place of business, they're not going to have a lot of time to share with you. They're not going to have a lot, uh, unless, how many of you have been in a restaurant where you're the only ones in there? And it's pretty well empty. Ever done that? Oh, that's a wonderful opportunity. Because <laughs> they don't want to be standing around and be bored any more than, than you do. You can engage them in conversation. They are free to share time with you until somebody else comes in. They have to take care of them. Um, so that that's a, a great opportunity uh, also. Um, there's a little bolder way that uh, an evangelist friend of ours uses. We've just read where the Lord has sent us out as believers. He goes, he tells people, you know what? God sent me here just to tell you that he loves you. And he cares about what's going on in your life, what, what you're going through. Now, some people look at you and go, my goodness, this guy's hearing voices. He's nuts. <laughs> but, you know, we've already been given the clear command. God has told us to share his love with them and that he cares about them and what's going on in their lives. Um, and there are a lot of folks who will appreciate uh, just you reminding them. And God can use you as such a tool in doing that. How many of you... Do not have a piece of paper or something to write with. My dear wife, would you? We, we tried to come prepared, okay? I want everybody to take a piece of paper and a pen. She's got several up here, and she's going to pass them out. Because I'm going to give you a, little, uh, a couple of little uh, things to write down, take some notes on. And uh, we'll have to get my mother-in-law involved, too. She'll, or she'll help. So, okay, hold your hands up. Okay, be sure everybody everybody gets one. There's pens and paper. Okay. Let me encourage you. Anytime you come to a service, or anytime you go to a conference or something like that, uh, bring something for taking notes on. And don't just take notes for you. It shouldn't be a dead-end message. Take notes so that you can then take those notes and share them with somebody else who can use them. That's part of the multiplication. That's part of that uh, reproduction uh, that we do as, as believers. So uh, uh, I want to I have you do a couple of things. On, uh, I want you to write down two words to describe your life before Christ. Now, if you think back to, some of you may have been years and years. Some of you may not be. Maybe it's just uh, uh, within the last 
year, a few months, weeks, I don't know. Write down two words, two things, briefly, that could describe your life before Christ. Now, you could probably come up with a big, long list, and that's fine. You can list all you want, but we're going to pull two of them out in a minute for a little bitty exercise. I'm not going to ask you to share tonight, but uh, I, I will show you how you can do this. Okay. And then I want you to draw a line and write down two adjectives that would describe your life after Christ. How were those first two things changed to two other different things? What kind of difference did the Lord make in your life? In other words, two words to describe your life after meeting Christ, after coming to know Him. We're told there's only one way to get to know to, to come to a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, a way to be saved. And that's through belief and repentance. That's through belief, confessing Him as, as Lord, and then turning around, going the opposite direction. Um, and so, what I want you to do, this is a quick way, you can give a 15 second testimony, and plant that seed, and, uh, and also engage somebody in conversation um, and find out real quick if they're a believer or not. Take those two adjectives and plug them in. I want you to write down this phrase, there was a time in my life when. There was a time in my life when. After that, pick two of those on that list uh, from your life before Christ. There was a time in my life when I was, or my life was, plug those words in. And then, that little transition period. And then, I ask the Lord to forgive me of my sin. And uh, chose to follow Him. And then my life was, and plug in two of those other adjectives, then my life became such and such. Let me give you an example. You know, there was a time in my life when I was totally selfish, it was all about me, and I wanted to be popular, and I realized I was nothing but sin, and I asked the Lord to forgive me, Jesus came into my life, and, and I chose to follow Him, and ever since then, my life has been a life of peace, and a life of purpose, way beyond anything I could ever plan for myself. And you can make that as brief as you want to, and Practice sharing that. 15 seconds. Follow it up. Here's the key. Follow it up with this. Do you have a story like that? You can hear somebody's testimony right back. Or you can have find out real quick, they don't even have a clue. And then, would you like to have? If they say no. Real quick, that's a, that's a real easy. That 15-second testimony is something that you can drop in uh, even on a, a busy time. Um, there's a lot of times to say, well, how's it going? Well, not been such a good day. You know, and uh, they could describe something going on in their lives, maybe a relationship situation. Wow, I'm, I'm sorry, we, we live in a really messed up world, you know. I know what you're like. My, you know, I, I was responsible for a lot of the mess up in my life. You know? um, 
Sometimes other people cause it. Sometimes we cause it ourselves. But, you know, I'll tell you what the Lord did for me, you know. There was a time in my life when, real quick, there's, uh, there's also something I want you to do on that little piece of paper. This is a tool that has been used all over the world. Uh, it's probably the simplest little tool that I can imagine. And I'm going to, uh, uh, to do kind of a, since I don't have a big a board up here or anything, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the, the air version. How's that? Okay. Um, most of the time when somebody is talking, this is called the three circles. You may be familiar with it, may not. If uh, you look it up uh, online, there's all kinds of variations of this thing. Uh, my pastor uh, actually was under uh, the gentleman that developed that initially. And uh, boy, he's, he's sold on it. He, he used it in sermons. He used it in training people. To, to share with others, and it, it's very simple, it's very to the point, and, uh, and I'll, I'm going to give you just a, a quick diagram. Uh, so, I like starting off, um, you can start off in, in a couple of different places on it, there's three circles to begin with, I'm going to start up on the top left, draw a big circle, and write God's design. Since I'm stretching, I'm going to take this jacket off. That's okay. <clears throat> I don't want to rip something or anything. So. Right, God's design. That's the way God created the world. You know? If you look back at Genesis and everything, he spoke everything into place. Every day he says, God looked and he said what? It's good. The last day, and, and he creates uh, man and, then, and he looks at everything before he rests and he says, God looked and he said, oh, it's very good. He's got a plan. He made it a perfect world, and it wasn't until we came in and messed it up, you know. Uh, draw another circle over here on the right-hand side. And you could just draw a little broken line through that, like you do sometimes with a little broken heart. In fact, if you wanted to, some people just draw the circle over here, the God's design, and they put a heart in it. Okay? Over on this side, you have that circle with a little broken line through it, and you can just wrote broken. And that's the world we live in. You can look around and you can describe the situations going on. In fact, if somebody tells you about something going on in their life, you say, the world's really messed up. Can I show you something right quick? And you draw that circle right there and you show brokenness. This is where we are. It is messed up. But this isn't the way that God created it to be. It's not the way it ought to be. But you know what happened? And you draw an arrow from God's design over to the other one and you put sin right over the top of that arrow. Sin was what took us from God's design over here to a world of brokenness. And you know, when we get over here in this world of brokenness, you can draw a bunch of little squiggly arrows off into space all the way around that thing, and we try all kinds of things to get out of that brokenness. We try being good enough. It just goes nowhere. We, we, try, uh, we try maybe success. Maybe getting enough money or possessions, you know, that, that just goes nowhere too. Some people try and escape or to numb everything down with an addiction of some kind or drugs or alcohol. That's another one that just goes off into nowhere. We try relationships. Maybe a new relationship will fix my world. <laughs> and that little arrow goes off nowhere. Why do all those arrows go off everywhere else? Because they don't address the sin right here top that, that put us where we are. So what happened? God said, I've got an answer. I can deal with this. And he sent down his son. Draw a circle down below. So you have a triangle of circles. Two up top, one at the bottom. Circle down below. And you can put the gospel. And you can put a little crown on top of that. And write Jesus through it. He sent his son down. In fact, if you, if you wanted to, you could draw an arrow down on the left side of that little circle and a cross in the middle to show how he came down into our world and then he dealt with this up here. He dealt with sin on the cross and then an arrow up on the other side to change our world, to lift us out of that. And so what do we do to get from right here in this broken world down here to the gospel? We repent or turn. You draw an arrow down from this one down to the bottom one. And you repent or turn and believe. 
You can take them to Scripture. You can pick any of the, the Roman road scriptures. You can pick any of those, those that uh, you've got that deal with, with all things. Up here at the top, you can do like Romans 3.23, for all of sin, fall short of the glory of God. You know? uh, you could, there are a number of passages you can use down here. You know? uh, and then, once you have the gospel that you've, where you've repented and believed the gospel, and Jesus picks you up out of that, then what do you do? Draw the arrow back up here. Now, it's not going to be perfect the way God intended it to be, but guess what? Our world will be different, and we'll be headed to a place that is perfect the way God intended it to be, and how would we, we go from down here after salvation to follow and obey. So there's a little arrow comes up over here to that first circle from the bottom one, follow and obey. Show them that get the, that's all there is to the little diagram. It's three circles, three arrows, a little crown on the circle at the bottom, and the words in there, God's design, brokenness or broken world, and at the bottom, the gospel in Jesus' name. And then you've got sin up top. You've got repent and believe here, and you've got follow and obey on the other side. Uh, once you get that drawn, you say, where do you see yourself in that diagram? Where is your world? What part of this are you in? And if they're honest, they'll, they'll tell you. You'll find out real quick. I've, I've trusted Jesus. Or <laughs> my world's pretty broken right now. And you know what? I can tell you how to get to the answer. And that's where you take them back. Here we go. All you got to do. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Shall be saved. Turn, repent, and and you know what? He'll make all the difference. And your world, while the world around you is still broken, and you still will have some some, uh, there'll still be some pain from from the sin in this old world. Guess what? You also have the peace of the Lord God in your life, and you have some direction. You have somebody to go through it with you, and somebody to to show you how to follow Jesus, become more like the example we all ought to have, and to obey. Uh, and one of the biggest problems we have in, in uh, churches today, we have for, forever focused so much on evangelism, focused on getting out there and getting people saved, and then, whoo, we've done our job. In fact, I used to have a, a, a preacher friend who said he was going to take up scuba diving to go look for all the members he hadn't seen since baptism. Because that's where we drop the ball. Not with baptism, but when they come out. That ought to be the starting point. And we had a, a big service last week over at Oak Hill. My pastor even he preached on baptism. And it wasn't a big emotional appeal. It broke down to what it ought to be. You know, It's for believers. It's to be, it happened after you're saved. Not as a, an infant or a child who doesn't understand. But after you have come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ as a testimony of what God's done in your life. Because before then... You got nothing to testify about, and then it says it's it's also by immersion. The word baptizo means to immerse. Rantizo means to pour. Uh, Ko means to sprinkle. It didn't use rantizo and ko. Those words are used for other things in the Bible. It uses baptizo, and the reason it was translated to baptism or transliterated, they created a new word, baptism, is because so many people were practicing all these different things. They didn't want to offend somebody, and so they came up with a new word, baptism, when they translated to English. And it, it caught on so that uh, everybody just adopted that. But you can go to several places in Scripture and see it's when they came up out of the water, it says, after when Jesus was baptized by John. They came up out of the water. There's a passage where Jesus and his disciples were out baptizing, said, and they were baptizing there. And John and his disciples, they were baptizing there too because there was much water. If you're going to be pouring it on somebody's head or going to be sprinkling on them, you don't need much water. And so uh, there are a lot of, uh, and, and you don't get the imagery of the death, burial, and resurrection with a pouring or a sprinkle. You don't get ready to, to bury the person up here in the casket by pouring a little dirt on his head. No, you submerge him. And uh, there's triple testimony. Anyway, we had, we had, that, uh, had that kind of service over there. And uh, he gave the invitation. And we have quite a few members over there. And the house was pretty full. And there were 19 people 
that came and he said, you know what? Um, we've got t-shirts back here in the back. Baptism t-shirt, church name on them. We've got shorts back there. And you bring you out and we'll baptize you right here at service. And uh, I'll tell you what, my wife and Pastor Ron, <laughs> well, Pastor Ron Cook, before service was there over, he was, he was already sending an email to the pastor. What are we going to do with these folks? How are we going to follow up? And he said, uh, after church, uh, he replied to him. He wasn't going to do it during the service. <laughs> he replied to him. He says, uh, we, we've got a plan. We're, we're, going, we're working on it. My wife, when she found out about it, she sent him says, uh, I hope we're going to do something with it. And he says, are you volunteering to disciple some? She says, yes, here's my schedule. And that's where our heart is because that's where we're going to make the difference in people. You, we do our best to grow them to maturity so that they can grow somebody else. And that's the way that the, the gospel spreads and that's the way the kingdom uh, multiplies. Um, everyday conversations. And uh, those are some of the, the best tools that I can give you if you need uh, clarification on any of that when we're, when we're done. I will uh, I'll share that with you. You know, there's examples in Acts. And I'm just going to give you the references and, and mention them real quick. You can write them down. Uh, where everyday conversations became Jesus-exalting conversations or gospel conversations. Peter and John uh, came across a lame man. He's begging outside the gate, and they stopped and said, uh, look at us. He said, uh, we don't have any silver and gold, but what we do have, we'll give to you. And uh, they, of course, naturally healed the man. What can we do? We said, look, <laughs> we see somebody begging. Um, we do a lot of our stuff like probably a lot of you, a lot of it in plastic. I don't keep a lot of cash on me. Um, and so we said, look, I don't have any money on me, but what I've got, I'll be glad to share with you. You know, I have got something that makes a difference. I was just as, I was just as, as homeless <laughs> in, in a lot of ways as, as you are. I, I was so far away from God and so far messed up. Guess what? I can tell you how to, how to have the peace that I found. Give you an opportunity. Philip. Uh, God tells him to go out and to uh, heading off toward the, the south out in the desert and he sees a, a man riding by in a chariot reading the book of Isaiah and he says, go catch that chariot. Go, go uh, find that man. And he, what's he do? He hears him reading and says, hey, do you, do you understand what you're reading? I, I have no clue. Boy, it's a perfect opportunity right there. You know, somebody's already reading the gospel don't have a clue. Hey, he says, he invited him up in the chariot. Hey, come on, come on, explain it to me. Led him to the Lord there. Paul and Silas in prison. How many people do you think around us watch us when difficult situations and difficulties in life hit us? I guarantee you I had a lot of people watching when my mom passed and <laughs> my uncle passed. That, that was a, a weird situation anyway. My uncle was supposed to do the music for my mom's memorial service out in Savannah. He had it all in his head and died just a couple of days before the service. We had to start from scratch. So we had a mom's memorial service on Saturday and my uncle's funeral on Sunday. And that was tough. You know, he, was, he, was my, he was my inspiration as far as the whole music thing. And uh, he was one that had picked me up after a, a, being a young man who really made a lot of mistakes. Uh, he was one who picked me up, kind of dusted me off, pointed me back to my roots pointing back to my spiritual roots. And uh, I, I wouldn't take anything for it. You know what? People watch when you're facing difficulties. Paul and Silas are in prison. And it says they were singing. It's in uh, Acts 16, 25 through 34. And uh, it says the people were listening. The other prisoners were listening to them and what they were singing. And what happens? Earthquake comes. Chains fall off and everything. And uh, they wind up then getting to minister to the jailer because he was ready to kill himself. He said, oh my goodness, they're going to put me to death for what's about to happen. He said, no, 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 no. We're all here. Even these other prisoners, you'd think half of them would have run off. They didn't know the Lord. They didn't care what was going on. They just wanted out of there. And said, nope, we're all here. And he was able to lead him and his whole family to the Lord. Uh, Paul was one of the best in Athens 
he sees all these statues and all these altars to all these different gods and says, look, I see you have one over here. I see you're very religious people. Start with a compliment. I tell you're very religious, but I also saw you had an altar out here that said to the unknown God. A lot of people worship things. They don't have a clue what they're worshiping or what they're into, and even in our society. They, they're into things that they don't have a clue what they're getting into. Guess what? He said, I can, procl- I can tell you all about this God out here, this altar to the unknown God. I know him. I'll tell him all about it. And he was a great about turning that into, uh, into conversations. I want to close one one little thing um, to show you. You wonder, what can I do? What can we do as, uh, as a congregation? Um, in Acts chapter 19, there is this. Acts chapter 19, verses 7 through 12. Uh, Paul had gone to Ephesus. He had met some people who had been baptized only in the name of John and for repentance, didn't know anything about uh, Jesus and how he came to fulfill uh, all the prophecies and to be the Savior. So he proclaimed Jesus to them. They were, were baptized, and, and then uh, as they were saved, they, uh, the Holy Spirit fell upon them. Notice verse 7. Now the men were about 12 in all. Same number as Jesus started with the disciples. And he went to the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitudes, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. You might uh, overlook some things there. Depending on where you draw the boundary of Asia at that point, we're told that there was anywhere from 8 to 15 million people. And it started with 12. And in two years' time, it says, and this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus. Both Jew and, and Gentile and Greeks, just everybody heard. Uh, don't tell me that, uh, that we, with the power of the Holy Spirit, with the Word of God, that we cannot make a difference. There's a... It's kind of sad that we wind up uh, a lot of times <clears throat> doing this. We, we'll treat... We we'll treat our church like uh, this, and uh, with this is where we come to be the church. <laughs> and uh, that's, and it's kind of, I like using suckers because that's the world, the way the world sees us. A lot of times, you're just a bunch of suckers to believe what you believe, and and I find it even more ironic that uh, we pick dum dums as the brand. So, yeah, that's, uh, <clears throat> and we just wind up, you know, people look at us that way and go, boy, <laughs> bunch of. A bunch of goofballs in a box. Yeah. What we do here is only training for what we're to do out there. If we're the church here, we're to be the church out there. Remember 24-hour day, seven day a week? We're to be, as we go, we're to be sharing the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we're to love Him above everything else in our lives, I know, I'm a grandfather. i got three grandbabies. I'd love to show you pictures of they shouldn't be the first thing that I want to tell somebody about. The Lord Jesus ought to be. He ought to be my heartbeat. He ought to be my passion. And so uh, when we leave here, we, uh, we go all different kind of places. You know, we go up toward Brooks or Sonoya or Zebulon, back toward Griffin. I mean, just wherever you come from, we, we kind of scatter out. We don't stay in one spot. Um, we're to be the church wherever we go, doing just what uh, we were left here to do. And that is how we affect the world. And that's how we fill this up over and over and over and over too, by being the people that God wants it to be out here. And to reach the people who are hurting. That beginning poem, the very beginning, describes pretty well. Everybody out there feels that way. And the Lord gives us purpose and gives us meaning and what greater purpose that can we have than proclaiming our wonderful Lord, creator of the universe, sustainer, 
our Savior who gave everything for us. I can't add to that. That's, uh, I mean, y'all's going, you went long enough anyway, so. I hope that will uh, illustrate for you what we ought to be about. And uh, I'm not going to offer invitation tonight. I think the Lord offers that in each one of our hearts, and you, you respond to him as as he would direct. And uh, I'm just going to say, go be the church. And it has been a joy to be with you tonight. I won't leave these here this way. I, I may leave them in, the, you know, in something, so you, you can have them if you want them. They're still in the wrapper. So, uh, But uh, thank you for allowing me to be with you today. Uh, gracious folks, and I'm... I'll be praying for you as interim comes on board and you continue to look for the, the man God has for you um, long term. Pray that uh, you reach this community and wherever you're from as is our intent where we are. Um, that he may be uplifted and draw all people to him. That he receive the honor and the glory. Uh, he bore the cross. You know, only he can wear the crown. He... Uh, we're going to cast him at his feet. Boy, I'd love to have a nice one to throw at his feet. Not because of what it means for me, but because that's the only thing I'm going to have to give back to him. Everything else I have, guess what? He's given to me. I have nothing I can give to him except my life and my service. And one day, Lord willing, with his help, a crown to toss at his feet. So, thank you again. Uh, let us stand and and closing word of prayer. Okay? Thank you so much. Can I give a volunteer to lead it? Thank you.